Let's pray and then we'll hand over to Neil for our morning devotions. Let's all pray. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you that we have a chance to worship you this morning, both in song and in the work that we do and in our actions, Lord. We pray that you would be with Neil now as he brings us the word for this morning. And we pray that you would give him wisdom, that it would be your words on his lips, and that you would open our hearts and our minds to what is to be said. We thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. This has been a delight. It's been great. You know what a devotion is in a morning? It's supposed to set you up for the day. It's supposed to help you to train your mind on things that are above and not on the cares and concerns of this world. Because let's face it, you wake up in a morning, you're going, oh, I've got to do this. Oh, I've got to do that. Oh, I've got to do the other. Sorry, maybe that's just me. I need a devotion time every day. And I'll be brutally honest before all of you young and old, I'm not always the best at keeping it first thing in the morning. I struggle with it and have done my entire Christian life since I became a Christian as a teenager. But the one thing I know, and the one thing that continues to slap me around the face each day, is that I know the value of a devotion. And if you're not the one that gives you a slap each time, you know, you're, you're thinking of, oh, I can get away with not doing one, then there's something wrong there. Because you need to know how important a devotion is to your own soul each day, young or old, together or on your own, ideally both. It's important. Jesus took time, didn't he, to pray. Jesus took time to go and be by himself, whether in a boat, up a mountain, in a garden, wherever. We have the privilege of coming together to seek him at the start of this day. Can you turn to John chapter 11, please? In John chapter 11, we have a sad event. We have the death of Lazarus, Jesus' friend. He's a family friend, in fact, Jesus is, of Lazarus' family, Mary and Martha. And Lazarus has died, and Jesus isn't around. And so a message is sent to him, Lazarus has died, and he's gone, that's sad. But Jesus knows there is a, a greater opportunity here. And he takes his time when everyone else is going, but you need to come quickly. You need to come quickly. And he's going, it's all right. I have control of this. And so we read of the death of Lazarus. We read how uh, Jesus responds to um, Mary and Martha. And we read how Jesus weeps, not just over the death of his friend, but over that which is to come and over all Jerusalem. But we then come to verse 38. <clears throat> this is where I want to pick it up. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odour, a smell, a pong, for he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Now on to focus on one I'm going to say one person, but it's not. It's one set of people in this. 
You might be surprised who they are because certainly in the ESV, they're not named. It's they. You look at they in this portion of scripture and this is what's important. And I tell you this, this is not something that I've just picked up and gleaned myself. This is actually something that AIG use at the back end of a talk called Defending the Christian Faith in a Scientific Age, right? Simon uses it, Ken uses it in different ways. And I don't know about you, but sometimes when you hear a talk, you kind of latch on to a little bit of it and then your brain goes haywire, right? And you're going, oh, this is good because of this, 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 this. And that's what I did with this, right? So Jesus raises Lazarus, but before he raises Lazarus, what does he get them to do? What does he get them to do? He gets them to roll away the stone. Could Jesus have rolled away that stone? Well, of course he could. Stone, shift. Move, stone. He could have been really commanding. He could have even just thought it and the stone moved. But no, he asked them to move the stone. And then he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Could they have done that and it worked at that point? No. You see, what the case is here is that Jesus gets human beings, his followers, his disciples with small d. He gets them, he gets us to do what we can do. And then we entrust what we can't do, but he can. We entrust that to him. In my role at Answers in Genesis, I'm very much more a practical side of things, right? I'm not learned. I'm not a speaker. But I have to do what I can do and entrust the opportunities that God allows me to arrange to let the men who are gifted speakers and the scientists to be able to give of what they can give. And then actually, as far as AIG is concerned, it's then threefold because then we both then coming together and we're saying, God, add the increase. Because ultimately I could put on an event, Joseph could put on an event and nobody could come. All right, we're relying on God to bring the people in, right? Simon could be speaking, Joseph could be speaking, Diane could be speaking. You could be, you know, John could join on, on uh, Zoom, Skype, Restream, whatever works. And nobody could be sitting here. On the flip side, loads of people could be sitting here. This could be full, but everybody in essence has got earplugs in. And they're not listening. And they're not taking it in. See, as organizers or as speakers, we can only do what we can do. We need God to raise the dead. We need God to bring to life his words in our lives, right? Now, it's very easy after a, co a convention like this to go, yeah, I've learned lots, right? I'm going to take it home and I'm going to hammer it home to the first atheist I see, right? Not your dad. Go easy on him. All right. But be careful. Be careful. Because it's not about what you've learned. It's about whether God would use it through you. Jesus could have turned up to the tomb and he could have gone, right, okay, stone, move. Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus came out completely unbound. And he goes, you're right, Jesus, how are you? That's not the King James English, obviously. But it didn't. Not only did Jesus get the disciples or get them to do what they could do practically first. He also did it again afterwards. Because you see, Lazarus didn't come out unbound and go, how are you, everybody? Well, this is a crowd, isn't it? He 
came out and he was bound still. Could Jesus have made it so that he came out unbound? Of course he could. But no, he asks them again, doesn't he? Unbind him and let him go. So as God gives you opportunity to share, to do things for him, right? It's not just about sharing with your words. It's about doing things for the glory of God. Do them faithfully. Can you imagine? We don't, we don't read, do we, where uh, Jesus says, move the stone and they go, oh, it looks so heavy. I'm not sure I can be bothered. They don't moan. They do it. And that's what we're commanded to do. Do as Jesus commanded. And we're also told in 1 Peter to always be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within us with meekness and with fear, right? Or fear and trembling, right? Now, when you go into Lyme Regis today and you go into the fossil shops and you go, wow, that's a fossil. And then there's a great big sticker on it that says 63 million years old and you laugh your socks off and you, you just, you know, you go to the, the, the shopkeeper and go, you're wrong, mate. Is that really helping the situation? Is that you taking matters into your hands or is that you giving it to God to say, okay, I'm going to be gracious and I want God to add the increase. May you, maybe you can throw a, a, a portion of seeds, not me, please. You can throw a, a portion of seeds at... Uh, the situation, but, you know, Paul threw the seeds, Paulus watered. Who added the increase? God had the increase. You've got to let God do what only God can do. And so as I go home, as Simon goes home, as you guys stay here, and then as you go home, don't just go bullet a gate with everything that you've learned, but rather seek him. And be willing to do first before you say. Be calm. Bear witness to the one who can do it all and can raise the dead to life. I pray that will happen for Katrina, is it? Her father. We pray that it happens for my father. And I'm sure you can all think of people in your family or your circle of friends for whom you wish that they may be born again. You can't do anything, but Christ can.